The following is a conversation with Greg Brockman. He's the co-founder and CTO of OpenAI, a world-class research organization developing ideas in AI with the goal of eventually creating a safe and friendly artificial general intelligence, one that benefits and empowers humanity. OpenAI is not only a source of publications, algorithms, tools, and data sets. Their mission is a catalyst for an important public discourse about our future with both narrow and general intelligence systems. This conversation is part of the Artificial Intelligence Podcast at MIT and beyond. If you enjoy it, subscribe on YouTube, iTunes, or simply connect with me on Twitter at Lex Friedman, spelled F-R-I-D. And now, here's my conversation with Greg Brockman. So in high school, and right after you wrote a draft of a chemistry textbook, I saw that. That covers everything from basic structure of the atom to quantum mechanics. So it's clear you have an intuition and a passion for both the, uh, the physical world with chemistry and now robotics to the digital world with uh, AI, deep learning, reinforcement learning, and so on. Do you see the physical world and the digital world as different? And what do you think is the gap? A lot of it actually boils down to iteration speed. Right. That I think that a lot of what really motivates me is is building things. Right. Is the uh, you know, think about mathematics, for example, where you think really hard about a problem. You understand it. You're right down in this very obscure form that we call a proof. But then this is in humanity's library. Right. It's there forever. This is some truth that we've discovered. And, you know, maybe only five people in your field will ever read it. Uh, but somehow you've kind of moved humanity forward. And so I actually used to really think that I was going to be a mathematician. And uh, then I actually started writing this chemistry textbook. One of my friends told me, you'll never publish it because you don't have a PhD. So instead, I, I decided to build a website and try to promote my ideas that way. And then I discovered programming. And uh, I, you know, that in programming, you think hard about a problem. You understand it. You write it down in a very obscure form that we call a program. But then once again, it's in humanity's library, right? And anyone can get the benefit from it. And the scalability is massive. And so I think that the thing that really appeals to me about the digital world is that you can have this, this, this insane leverage, right? A single individual with an idea is able to affect the entire planet. Um, and that's something I think is really hard to do if you're moving around physical atoms. But you said uh, mathematics. So if you look at the, th the wet thing uh, over here, our mind, do you, you ultimately see it as just math is just information processing uh, or is there some other magic as you've seen if you've seen through biology and chemistry and so on yeah, i think it's really interesting to think about uh, humans as just information processing systems and uh, that it seems like it's actually a pretty good uh, way of describing a lot of of kind of how the world works or a lot of what we're capable of to think that that you know, again, if you just look at, at technological innovations over time, mm -hmm. that in some ways the most transformative innovation that we've had has been the computer, right? In some ways, the internet, you know, that what has the internet done, right? The internet is not about these physical cables. It's about the fact that I am suddenly able to instantly communicate with any other human on the planet. I'm able to retrieve any piece of knowledge that in some ways the human race has ever had. Uh, and that those are these insane transformations. Do you see the our society as a whole, the collective, as another extension of the intelligence of the human being? So if you look at the human being as an information processing system, you mentioned the internet, the networking. Do you see us all together as a civilization, as a, as a kind of intelligence system? Yeah, I think this is actually a really interesting perspective uh, to take and to think about that you sort of have this collective intelligence of all of society. The economy itself is the superhuman machine that is optimizing something right and it's almost in some ways a company has a will of its own right that you have all these individuals who are all pursuing their own individual goals and thinking really hard and thinking about the right things to do but somehow the company does something that is this emergent thing uh, and that is, is it's, a, it's a really useful abstraction mm -hmm. and so i think that in some ways you know we think of, of ourselves as the most intelligent things on the planet and the most powerful things on the planet but there are things that are bigger than us that are these systems that we all contribute to um, and so I think actually, you know, it's a, it's interesting to think about, uh, if you've read Isaac Isimov's foundation, right, that, uh, that there's this concept of psychohistory in there, uh, which is effectively this, that if you have trillions or quadrillions of, of beings, then maybe you could actually predict what that being, that, that huge macro being will do, uh, and, uh, almost independent of what the individuals want. And I actually have a, a second angle on this that I think is interesting, sure. which is thinking about, uh, technological determinism. One thing that, that I actually think a lot about with, with open AI, right, is that we're kind of coming on 
onto this insanely transformational technology of, of general intelligence, right, that will happen at some point. And there's a question of how can you take actions that will actually steer it to go better rather than worse? And that I think one question you need to ask is, as a scientist, as an inventor, as a creator, what impact can you have in general, right? You look at things like the telephone invented by two people on the same day. Like, what does that mean? Like, what does that mean about the shape of innovation? And I think that what's going on is everyone's building on the shoulders of the same giants. And so you can kind of, you can't really hope to create something no one else ever would. You know, if Einstein wasn't born, someone else would have come up with relativity. You know, he changed the timeline a bit. Right, that maybe it would have taken another 20 years, but it wouldn't be that fundamentally humanity would never discover these these fundamental truths. So there's some kind of invisible momentum that some people like Einstein or OpenAI is plugging into uh, that anybody else can also plug into, and ultimately it, that wave takes us into a certain direction. That's what you mean that, by digital. That, that's right. That's right. And you know, this kind of seems to play out in a bunch of different ways. Uh, that there's some exponential that is being ridden, and that the exponential itself, which one it is, changes. Think about Moore's law. An entire industry set its clock to it for 50 years. Like, how can that be? Right? How is that possible? And yet somehow it happened. And so I think you can't hope to ever invent something that no one else will. Maybe you can change the timeline a little bit, but if you really want to make a difference, I think that the thing that you really have to do, the only real degree of freedom you have is to set the initial conditions under which a technology is born. And so you think about the internet, right? That there are lots of other competitors trying to build similar things and the internet won and that the initial conditions were that it was created by this group that really valued people being able to be, uh, you know, anyone being able to plug in this very academic mindset of, of being open and connected. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the internet for the next 40 years really played out that way. Um, you know, maybe today uh, things are starting to, to shift in a, in a different direction, but I think that those initial conditions were really important to determine the next 40 years worth of, of progress. That's really beautifully put. So another example of that I think about, you know, I recently looked at it. I looked at Wikipedia, the formation of Wikipedia, and I wonder what the internet would be like if Wikipedia had ads. Hmm. You know, there's a interesting argument that uh, why they chose not to make it uh, put advertisement on Wikipedia. I think it's uh, I think Wikipedia is one of the greatest resources we have on the internet. It's, it's extremely surprising how well it works and how well it was able to aggregate all this kind of uh, good information. And they, essentially, the creator of Wikipedia, I don't know, there's probably some debates there, but set the initial conditions and yes. now it carried itself forward. That's really interesting. So you're the way you're thinking about AGI or artificial intelligence is you're focused on setting the initial conditions for the, for the progress. That's right. That's powerful. Okay, so look into the future. If you create an AGI system, like one that can ace the Turing test, natural language, what do you think would be the interactions you would have with it? What do you think are the questions you would ask? Like what would be the first question you would ask? It, her, him. That's right. I think that... At that point, if you've really built a powerful system that is capable of shaping the future of humanity, the first question that you really should ask is how do we make sure that this plays out well? Um, and so that's actually the first question that I would ask a powerful AGI system is. So you wouldn't ask your colleague, you wouldn't ask like Ilya, you would ask the AGI system. Oh, we've already had the conversation with Ilya, okay. right? And everyone here. Uh, and so you want as many perspectives and uh, a piece of wisdom as you can for, for answering this question. So I don't think you necessarily defer to whatever your powerful system tells you, um, but you use it as one input uh, to try to figure out what to do. But and I, I guess fun fundamentally, what it really comes down to is if you built something really powerful and you think about, think about, for example, the creation of, uh, of shortly after the creation of nuclear weapons, right? The most important question in the world was what's the world order going to be like? How do we set ourselves up in a place where we're going to be able to su survive as a species? With AGI, I think the question is slightly different, right? That there is a question of how do we make sure that we don't get the negative effects, but there's also the positive side, right? You imagine that, you know, like, like what will an AGI be like? Like what will it be capable of? And I think that, that one of the core reasons that an AGI can be powerful and transformative is actually due to uh, technological development, yeah. right? If you have something that's capable, as capable as a human and that it's much more scalable, uh, that you absolutely want that thing to go read the whole scientific literature and think about how to create cures for all the diseases, right? You want it to think about how to go and build uh, technologies to help us create material abundance and to figure out societal problems that we have trouble with, like how are we supposed to clean up the environment? And you know, maybe you want this uh, to go and invent a bunch of little robots that will go out and uh, be biodegradable and uh, turn ocean debris into har harmless uh, molecules. And um, I think that that 
that positive side is something that I think people miss sometimes when thinking about what an AGI will be like. Um, and so I think that if you have a system that's capable of all of that, you absolutely want its advice about how do I make sure that we're using your uh, your capabilities in a positive way for humanity. So what do you think about that psychology that uh, looks at all the different possible trajectories of an AGI system, many of which, perhaps the majority of which are positive, and nevertheless focuses on the negative trajectories? I mean, you get to interact with folks, you get to think about this, maybe within yourself as well. Um, you look at Sam Harris and so on. It seems to be, sorry to put it this way, but almost more fun to think about the negative mm -hmm. possibilities whatever that's deep in our psychology, what do you think about that? And how do we deal with it? Because we want AI to help us. So I, I think there's kind of two problems uh, in, entailed in that question. Uh, the first <clears throat> is more of the question of how can you even picture what a world with a new technology will right. be like? Now imagine we're in 1950 and I'm trying to describe Uber to someone. <laughs> <laughs> Apps and the internet. Yeah, I mean, you're, that's, that's, that's going to be extremely complicated, but it's imaginable. It's, it's imaginable, right? But, and now imagine being in 1950 and predicting Uber, right? And you need to describe the internet, you need to describe GPS, you need to describe the fact that everyone's going to have this phone in their pocket. And so I think that, that just the first truth is that it is hard to picture how a transformative technology will play out in the world. Um, we've seen that before with technologies that are far less transformative than AGI will be. And so I think that, that that one piece is that it's just even hard to imagine and to really put yourself in a world where you can predict what that that positive vision would, would be like. And, you know, I think the second thing is that it is, I think it is always easier to support the negative side than the positive side. It's always easier to destroy than create. And you know, less in a in a in a in a physical sense, and more just in a in an intellectual sense, right? Because you know, I think that that with creating something, you need to just get a bunch of things right, and to destroy, you just need to get one thing wrong. Yeah. And so, I think that that what that means is that I think a lot of people's thinking dead ends as soon as they see the negative story. But that being said, I actually actually have some hope, right? I think that that the that the positive vision is something that I think can be. Um, is something that we can we can talk about. And I think that just simply saying this fact of, yeah, like there's positive, there's negatives, everyone likes to dwell on the negative. People actually respond well to that message and say, huh, you're right, there's a part of this that we're not talking about, not thinking about. And that's actually something that's, that's, that's I think really been a key part of how we think about AGI at OpenAI, right? You can kind of look at it as like, okay, like OpenAI talks about the fact that there are risks and yet they're trying to build this system. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you square those those two facts? So do you share the intuition that some people have, uh, I mean, from Sam Harris to even Elon Musk himself, that it's tricky as you develop AGI to keep it from slipping into the existential threats, into the negative? What's your intuition about how hard is it to keep AI development on the positive track? And what's your intuition there? To, to answer that question, you can really look at how we structure OpenAI. So we really have three main arms. So we have capabilities, which is actually doing the technical work mm -hmm. and pushing forward what these systems can do. There's safety, which is working on technical mechanisms to ensure that the systems we build are aligned with human values. And then there's policy, which is making sure that we have governance mechanisms, answering that question of, well, whose values? And so I think that the technical safety one is the one that people kind of talk about the most, right? You talk about, like, think about, you know, all of the dystopic AI movies, a lot of that is about not having good technical safety in place. Um, and what we've been finding is that, you know, I think that actually a lot of people look at the technical safety problem and think it's just intractable, right? This question of what do humans want? How am I supposed to write that down? Can I even write down what I want? Mm -hmm. No way. And then they stop there. But the thing is, we've already built systems that are able to learn things that humans can't specify. You know, even the rules for how to recognize if there's a cat or a dog in an image. Right. Turns out it's intractable to write that down, and yet we're able to learn it. And that what we're seeing with systems we build at OpenAI, and they're still in early proof of concept stage, is that you are able to learn human preferences. You're able to learn what humans want from data. Um, and so that's kind of the core focus for our technical safety team. And I think that, uh, that there actually, we've had some pretty encouraging updates in terms of what we've been able to make work. So you have an intuition and a hope that from data, 
you know, looking at the value alignment problem from data, we can build systems that align with the collective better angels of our nature. So align with the, the ethics and the morals of human beings. To even say this in a different way, I mean, think about how, how do we align humans, right? Think about like right. a human baby can grow up to be an evil person or a great person. And a lot of that is from learning from data, right? That you have some feedback as a child is growing up, they get to see positive examples. And so I think that that just like I mean, the, the, the only example we have of a general intelligence uh, that is able to learn from data uh, to align with human values and to learn values, um, I think we shouldn't be surprised that we can do the same sorts of, of, of techniques or whether the same sort of techniques end up being how we, we, we solve value alignment for AGIs. So let's go even uh, higher. I don't know if you've read the book Sapiens, mm -hmm. but uh, there's an idea that, you know, um, that as a collective, as us human beings, we kind of develop together an, uh, ideas that we hold. There's no, in that context, objective truth. We just kind of all agree to certain ideas and hold them as a collective. Mm -hmm. so do you have a sense that there is, in the world of good and evil, do you have a sense that to the first approximation, there are some things that are good? And that you could teach systems to behave to be good. So I think that, that this actually blends into the, our third team, right, which is the policy team. And this is the one, the, the aspect that I think people really talk about way less than they should, right? Because imagine that we build super powerful systems that we've managed to figure out all the mechanisms for these things to do whatever the operator wants. The most important question becomes who's the operator? What do they want? And how is that going to affect everyone else, right? And and I think that this question of what is good, what are those values? I mean, I think you, you don't even have to go to those 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 very grand existential places to start to, to realize how hard this problem is. You just look at different countries and cultures across the world, right. and that there's there's a very different conception of how the world works and you know what 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 kinds of uh, of ways that society wants to operate. And so I think that that the that the really core question is is is, is actually very concrete. Um, and I think it's not a question that we have ready answers to, right? Is how do you have a world where all of the different countries that we have, United States, China, Russia, and you know the the the, the hundreds of other countries out there are able to continue to not just operate in the way that, that they that they see fit but in in a that the, the world that emerges um in these where, where you have these very powerful systems uh operating alongside humans ends up being something that empowers humans more that makes like exi human existence be a more meaningful thing and uh that people are happier and wealthier and uh able to live more fulfilling lives it's not an obvious thing for how to design that world once you have that very powerful system so if we take a little step back and we're having a, like a fascinating conversation and uh, OpenAI is in many ways a tech leader in the world. And yet we're thinking about these big existential questions, which is fascinating, really important. I think you're a leader in that space and that's a really important space of just thinking how AI affects society in a, in a big picture view. So Oscar Wilde said, we're all in the gutter, but some of us are looking at the stars. And I think OpenAI has a charter that looks to the stars, I would say, to create intelligence, to create general intelligence, make it beneficial, safe, and collaborative. So can you tell me uh, how that came about, how a mission like that and the path to creating a mission like that at OpenAI was founded? Yeah, so I think that in some ways it really boils down to taking a look at the landscape, right? So if you think about the history of AI, that basically for the past 60 or 70 years, People have thought about this goal of what could happen if you could automate human intellectual labor. Right. Imagine you can build a computer system that could do that. What becomes possible? We have a lot of sci-fi that tells stories of various dystopias. And you know, increasingly you have movies like Her that tell you a little bit about maybe more of a little bit utopic vision. Uh, you think about the impacts that we've seen from being able to uh, have bicycles for our minds and computers uh, and that I think that the the, the impact of, of computers and the internet has just far outstripped what anyone really could have predicted. And so I think that it's very clear that if you can build an AGI, it will be the most transformative technology that humans will ever create. And so what it boils down to then is a question of, well, is there a path? Is there hope? Is there a way to build such a system? And I think that for 60 or 70 years that people got excited and uh, uh, that, you know, ended up not being able to deliver on the hopes that, that, that people had pinned on them. 
and I think that then you know that after you know two two winters of AI development, uh, that people uh, you know I think kind of almost stopped daring to dream, right? That, that really talking about AGI or thinking about AGI became al- almost this taboo in the community. Mm-hmm. But I actually think that people took the wrong lesson from AI history. And if you look back, starting in 1959 is when the Perceptron was released. And this is basically you know, one of the earliest neural networks. Um, it was released to what was perceived as this massive overhype. So in the New York Times in 1959, you have this article uh, saying that you know, the, the Perceptron will one day recognize people, call out their names, instantly translate speech between languages. Mm-hmm. And people at the time looked at this and said, this is... Like your system can't do any of that and basically spent 10 years trying to discredit the whole perceptron direction and, su- and succeeded and all the funding dried up and you know people kind of uh, went in other directions and you know in the 80s there was this resurgence and i'd always heard that the resurgence in the 80s was due to the invention of back propagation and these these algorithms that got people excited but actually the causality was due to people building larger computers that you can find these these articles from the 80s saying that the democratization of computing power suddenly meant that you could run these larger neural networks and then people started to do all these amazing things the back propagation algorithm was invented and you know that the the neural nets people were running were these tiny little like 20 neuron neural nets right right like what are you supposed to learn with 20 neurons yeah and so of course they weren't able to get great results and it really wasn't until 2012 that this approach that's almost the most simple natural approach that people had come up with in the 50s right in some ways even in the 40s before there were computers with the pitts McCollin ne- neuron, suddenly this became the best way of solving problems, right? And I think there are three core properties that deep learning has that I think are very worth paying attention to. The first is generality. We have a very small number of deep learning tools, SGD, deep neural net, maybe some, some you know, RL, and it solves this huge variety of problems, hmm. speech recognition, machine translation, game playing, all of these problems small set of tools. So there's the generality. There's a second piece, which is the competence. You want to solve any of those problems? Throw out 40 years worth of normal computer vision research, replace it with a deep neural net. It's going to work better. And there's a third piece, which is the scalability, right? That one thing that has been shown time and time again is that you, if you have a larger neural network, throw more compute, more data at it, it will work better. Those three properties together feel like essential parts of building a general intelligence. Now, it doesn't just mean that if we scale up what we have, that we will have an AGI, right? There are clearly missing pieces. There are missing ideas. We need to have answers for reasoning. But I think that the core here is that for the first time, it feels that we have a paradigm that gives us hope that general intelligence can be achievable. And so as soon as you believe that, everything else becomes comes into focus, right? If you imagine that you may be able to, and, you know, that the timeline, I think, remains uncertain, um, the, the, but I think that, that you know, certainly within our lifetimes and possibly within a, a much shorter period of time than, than people would expect, if you can really build the most transformative technology that will ever exist, you stop thinking about yourself so much, right? And you start thinking about just like, how do you have a world where this goes well? And that you need to think about the practicalities of how do you build an organization and get together a bunch of people and resources um, and to make sure that people feel uh, motivated and ready to, to do it. But I think that then you start thinking about, well, what if we succeed? Um, and how do we make sure that when we succeed, that the world is actually the place that, that, that we want ourselves to exist in and you know, almost in the, the Rawlsy and Bale sense of the word. And so that's kind of the, the, the broader landscape. And OpenAI was really formed in 2015 with that high-level picture of AGI might be possible sooner than people think, and that uh, we need to try to do our best to make sure it's going to go well. And then we spent the next couple of years really trying to figure out what does that mean, how do we do it? Um, and you know, I think that typically with a company, you start out very small, so you and a co-founder and you build a product, you get some users, you get product market fit, you know, then at some point you raise some money, you hire people, you scale, and then, uh, you know, down the road, then the big companies realize you exist and try to kill you. Um, and for OpenAI, it was basically everything in exactly the opposite order. Uh, <laughs> let me just pause for a second. You said a lot of things and let me just admire the jarring aspect of what OpenAI stands for, which is uh, daring to dream. I mean, you said it, it's pretty powerful. It caught me off guard because I think that's very true. The 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 step of just daring to dream about the possibilities of creating intelligence in a positive and a safe way, but just even creating intelligence is uh, 
a much needed refreshing uh, catalyst for the AI community. So that's that's the starting point. Okay. So then formation of OpenAI. Uh, what's uh, I just I would just say that you know when we were starting OpenAI, uh, that kind of the first question that we had is, is it too late to start a lab <laughs> with a bunch of the best people? Right. Wow, is that even okay. possible? Right? That was an actual question. That was, that was, that was really that was, that was the core question of uh, wow. of you know we had this dinner in July of 20, 2015, and there's that was that was really what we spent the whole time talking about, and uh, you know because it's the, you think about kind of where AI was is that it had transitioned from being an academic pursuit to an industrial pursuit, mm -hmm. and so a lot of the best people were in these big research labs, and that we wanted to start our own one that you know no matter how much resources we could accumulate would be you know, pale in comparison to the big tech companies. And we knew that. And there was a question of, are we going to be actually able to get this thing off the ground? You need critical mass. You can't just do you and a co-founder build a product, right? You really need to have a group of, you know, five to 10 people. And uh, we kind of concluded it wasn't obviously impossible. Uh, so it seemed worth trying. <laughs> well, you're also dreamers. So who knows, right? That's right. Okay. So, so speaking of that, competing with, with the, with the big players, um, Let's talk about some of the some of the tricky things as you think through this process of growing, of uh, seeing how you can develop these systems at a sc at scale that competes. So you recently recently formed OpenAI LP, a new cap profit company that now carries the name OpenAI. So OpenAI is now this official company. The original nonprofit company still exists and carries the OpenAI nonprofit name. So can you explain what this company is, what the purpose of its creation is, and how did you arrive at the decision yep. to create it? OpenAI, the whole entity, and OpenAI LP as a vehicle, uh, is trying to accomplish the mission of ensuring that artificial general intelligence benefits everyone. And the main way that we're trying to do that is by actually trying to build general intelligence ourselves and make sure the benefits are distributed to the world. That's the primary way. We're also fine if someone else does this. Right? It doesn't have to be us. If someone else is going to build an AGI and make sure that the benefits don't get locked up in one company or you know one 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 with one set of people, um, like we're actually fine with that. And so those ideas are baked into our charter, which is kind of the 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 foundational document that are that describes kind of our values and, and how how we operate. Um, but it's also really baked into the structure of OpenAI LP. And so the way that we've set up OpenAI LP is that. In the case where we succeed, right, if we actually build what we're trying to build, then investors are able to get a return, um, and but that return is something that is capped. And so if you think of AGI in terms of the, the value that you could really create, you're talking about the most transformative technology ever created. It's going to create orders of magnitude more value than any existing company, and that all of that value will be owned by the world, like legally titled to the nonprofit to fulfill that mission. And so that's that's the structure. So the mission is a powerful one, and it's uh, it's one that I think most people would agree with. It's how we would hope AI progresses. And so how do you tie yourself to that mission? How do you make sure you do not deviate from that mission that um, you know other incentives that are profit driven? Wouldn't uh, don't interfere with the mission. So th this was actually a really core question for us uh, for the past couple of years because you know I'd say that like the way that our history went was that for the first year we were getting off the ground right we had this high level picture uh, but we didn't know exactly how we wanted to accomplish it mm -hmm. and uh, really two years ago is when we first started realizing in order to build AGI we're just going to need to raise way more money uh, than we can as a nonprofit um, and you know we're talking many billions of dollars mm -hmm. and so. The first question is, how are you supposed to do that and stay true to this mission? And we looked at every legal structure out there and concluded none of them were quite right for what we wanted to do. And I guess it shouldn't be too surprising if you're going to do some like crazy unprecedented technology that you're going to have to come up with some crazy unprecedented structure to do it in. And uh, a lot of a lot of our conversation was uh, with people at OpenAI, right? The people who really joined because they believe so much in this mission and thinking about how do we actually raise the resources to do it and also stay true to, to what we stand for. 
And the place you got to start is to really align on what is it that we stand for, right? What are those values? What's really important to us? And so I'd say that we spent about a year really uh, compiling the OpenAI charter and that that determines, and if you even look at the first the first line item in there, it says that, look, we expect we're going to have to marshal huge amounts of resources, but we're going to make sure that we minimize conflict of interest with the mission. Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of aligning on all of those pieces was the most important step towards figuring out how do we structure a company that can actually raise the resources to do what we need to do? I imagine OpenAI, uh, the decision to create OpenAI LP was a really difficult one. And there was a lot of discussions, as you mentioned, for a year. And uh, there's different ideas, perhaps detractors within OpenAI, uh, sort of uh, different paths that you could have taken. What were those concerns? What were the different paths considered? What was that process of making that decision like? Yep. Um, but so if you look actually at the OpenAI charter, that there's almost two paths embedded within it. Mm -hmm. There is, we are primarily trying to build AGI ourselves, but we're also okay if someone else does it. And this is a weird thing for a company. It's really interesting, actually. Yeah. There, there is an element of competition that you do want to be the one that does it, but at the same time, you're okay if somebody else does it. And we'll talk about that a little bit, that trade-off, that's that dance that's really interesting. And I think this was the core tension as we were designing OpenAI LP and really the OpenAI strategy, is how do you make sure that both you have a shot at being a primary actor, which really requires building an organization, raising massive resources, and really having the will to go and execute on some really, really hard vision Right? You need to really sign up for a long period to go and take on a lot of pain and a lot of risk. Um, and to do that, normally you just import the startup mindset right? and that you think about, okay, like how do we out-execute everyone? You, you have this very competitive angle. But you also have the second angle of saying that, well, the true mission isn't for OpenAI to build AGI. The true mission is for AGI to go well for humanity. And so how do you take all of those first actions and make sure you don't close the door on outcomes that would actually be positive and, and, and fulfill the mission. And so I think it's a very delicate balance, right? And I think that going 100% one direction or the other is clearly not the correct answer. And so I think that even in terms of just how we talk about OpenAI and think about it, there's just like, like one thing that's always in the back of my mind is to make sure that we're not just saying OpenAI's goal is to build AGI, right? That it's actually much broader than that, right? That first of all, uh, you know, it's not just AGI, it's safe AGI. It's very important. But secondly, our goal isn't to be the ones to build it. Our goal is to make sure it goes well for the world. And so I think that figuring out how do you balance all of those um, and to, to get people to really come to the table and compile the the like a single document that, that encompasses all of that wasn't trivial. So part of the challenge here is uh, your mission is, I would say, beautiful, empowering, and a beacon of hope for people in the research community and just people thinking about AI. So your decisions are scrutinized more than I think a regular profit driven company. Do you feel the burden of this in the creation of the charter and just in the way you operate? Yes. <laughs> uh, so why do you uh, lean into the burden <laughs> by creating such a charter? Yeah. Why not keep it quiet? I mean, it just boils down to the, to the mission, right? Like, like I'm here and everyone else is here because we think this is the most important mission, right? Dare to, dare to dream. All right. So my, uh, do you think you can be good for the world or create an AGI system that's good when you're a for-profit company? From my perspective, I don't understand why profit uh, interferes with uh, positive impact on society. I don't understand uh, why uh, Google that makes most of its money from ads can't also do good for the world or other companies, Facebook, anything. I don't, I don't understand why those have to interfere. You know, you can, um, profit isn't the thing in my view that affects the impact of a company. What affects the impact of the company is the charter, is the culture, is the, you know, the people inside and profit is the thing that just fuels those people. So what what are your views there? Yeah, so I think I think that's a it's a really good question, and there's 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 some some you know real like long, long standing debates in human society that are wrapped up in it. Uh, the way that I think about it is just think about what what are the most impactful nonprofits in the world? What are the most impactful for profits in the world? 
Right. It's much easier to list the for profits. That's right. And I think that there's there's some real truth here that the system that we set up, the system for, for kind of how you know today's world is organized, um, is one that that really allows for huge impact. Um, and that that you know, kind of part of that is that you need to be that the you know for for profits are are self sustaining and able to to kind of you know build on their own momentum. Um, and I think that's a really powerful thing. It's something that when it turns out that we haven't set the guardrails correctly, causes problems, right? Think about logging companies that go and deforest, uh, you know, the, the rainforest. That's really bad. We don't want that. Um, and it's actually really interesting to me that kind of this this question of how do you get positive benefits out of a for-profit company, it's actually very similar to how do you get positive benefits out of an AGI, um, right? That you have this like very powerful system. It's more powerful than any human and uh, is kind of autonomous in some ways. You know, it's superhuman in a lot of axes. And somehow you have to set the guardrails to get good things to happen. But when you do, the benefits are massive. And so I think that that when when I think about nonprofit versus for-profit, I think just not enough happens in nonprofits. They're very pure, but it's just kind of, you know, it's just hard to do things there. Um, in for-profits in some ways, like too much happens. Um, but um, if if kind of shaped in the right way, it can actually be very positive. And so with OpenAI LP, we're, we're picking a road in between. Now, the thing that I think is really important to recognize is that the way that we think about OpenAI LP is that in the world where AGI actually happens, right? In a world where we are successful, we build the most transformative technology ever, the amount of value we're going to create will be astronomical. Mm-hmm. And so then in that case, that the, that the 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 cap that we have will be a small fraction of the value we create. Um, and the amount of value that, that goes back to investors and employees looks pretty similar to what would happen in a, in a pretty successful startup. And that's really the case that we're optimizing for, right? That we're thinking about in the success case, making sure that the value we create doesn't get locked up. And I expect that in another you know, for-profit companies that it's possible to do something like that. I think it's not obvious how to do it, right? And I think that as a for-profit company, you have a lot of fiduciary duty to your shareholders and that there are certain decisions that you just cannot make. Um, in our structure, we've set it up so that we have a fiduciary duty to the charter, right. that we always get to make the decision that is right for the charter um, rather than even if it comes at the expense of our own stakeholders. And uh, And so I think that when I think about what's really important. It's not really about nonprofit versus for profit. It's really a question of if you build AGI and you, you kind of, you know, humanity is now in this new age, who benefits? Whose lives are better? Um, and I think that what's really important is to have an answer that is everyone. Yeah, which is one of the core aspects of the charter. So one concern people have, not just with OpenAI, but with Google, Facebook, Amazon, anybody uh, really, uh, that's, uh, that's creating impact at scale is how do we avoid, as your charter says, avoid enabling the use of AI or AGI to unduly concentrate power? Why would not a company like OpenAI keep all the power of an AGI system to itself? The charter. The charter. So, you know, how does the charter actionalize itself in uh, day-to-day? So I think that the first to, to zoom out, right, that the way that we structure the company is so that the the power for sort of, you know, dictating the actions that OpenAI takes ultimately rests with the board, right? The board of, of, of the nonprofit um, and, and the board is set up in certain ways with certain certain restrictions that you can read about in the OpenAI LP blog post. Um, but effectively, the board is the is the governing body for OpenAI LP. Um, and the, the board has a duty to fulfill the mission of the nonprofit. Um, and so that's kind of how we tie, how, how we thread all these things together. Um, now there's a question of, so day to day, how do people, the individuals who in some ways are the most empowered ones, right? You know, the board sort of gets to call the shots at the high level, but the people who are actually executing are the employees, right? The people here on a day to day basis who have the, you know, the, the keys to the technical kingdom. And there, I think that the answer looks a lot like, well, how does any company's values get actualized, right? And I think that a lot of that comes down to that you need people who are here because they really believe in that mission um, and they believe in the charter and that they are willing to take actions uh, that maybe are worse for them, but are better for the charter. Um, and that's something that's really baked into the culture. And honestly, I think it's, uh, you know, I think that that's one of the things that we really have to work to preserve as time goes on. Um, and that's a really important part of how we think about hiring people and bringing people into open AI. So there's people here, there's people here who could speak up 
and say, like, hold on a second, this is totally against what we stand for. Uh, culture wise. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think that, uh, that we actually have, I think a, that's like a pretty important part of, of how, how we operate and how we have, even again, with designing the charter and, and designing open ALP in the first place, uh, that there has been a lot of conversation with employees here. And a lot of times where employees said, wait a second, this seems like it's going in the wrong direction and let's talk about it. And so I think one thing that's, that's, I think a really, and you know, here's, here's actually one thing that I think is very unique about us as a small company is that if you're at a massive tech giant, it's a little bit hard for someone who's a line employee to go and talk to the CEO right. and say, I think that we're doing this wrong. Um, and, you know, you look at companies like Google that have had some collective action from employees to, you know, make uh, ethical change around things like Maven. Um, and so maybe there are mechanisms at other companies that work. Um, but here, super easy for anyone to pull me aside, to pull Sam aside, to pull Ily aside. Yeah. And people do it all the time. One of the interesting things in the charter is this idea that it'd be great if you could try to describe or untangle of switching from competition to collaboration and late stage AGI development. Yep. It's really interesting, this dance between competition and collaboration. How do you think about that? Yeah, assuming that you can actually do the technical side of AGI development, I think there's going to be two key problems with figuring out how do you actually deploy it and make it go well. The first one of these is the run up to building the first AGI. Mm -hmm. um, you look at how self-driving cars are being developed and it's a competitive race. And the thing that always happens in a competitive race is that you have huge amounts of pressure to get rid of safety. And so that's one thing we're very concerned about, right? Is that people, multiple teams figuring out we can actually get there, but you know, if we took the slower path that is more guaranteed to be safe, we will lose. And so we're gonna take the fast path. And so the more that we can both ourselves be in a position where we don't generate that competitive race, where we say if the race is being run and that you know someone else is, is further ahead than we are, we're not going to try to to leapfrog. We're going to actually work with them, right? We will help them succeed as long as what they're trying to do is to fulfill our mission. Then we're good. We don't have to build AGI ourselves, um, and I think that's a really important commitment from us. But it can't just be unilateral, right? I think that it's really important that other players who are serious about building AGI make similar commitments. Right. And I think that, uh, that, you know, again, to the extent that everyone believes that AGI should be something to benefit everyone, then it actually really shouldn't matter which company builds it. And we should all be concerned about the case where we just race so hard to get there that something goes wrong. So what role do you think government, our favorite entity, has in setting policy and rules about this domain from research to the development to uh, early stage to late stage a AI and AGI development? So I think that, that first of all, um, it's really important the government's in there, right? In some way, shape, or form, you know, at the end of the day, we're talking about building technology that will shape how the world operates and that there needs to be government as part of that answer. And so that's why we've, uh, we've, we've done a number of different congressional testimonies. We uh, interact with a number of different lawmakers uh, and uh, that, you know, right now, a lot of our message to them is that it's not the time for regulation, it is the time for measurement, right? It, that our main policy recommendation is that people, and you know, the government does this all the time with bodies like NIST, um, mm -hmm. spend time trying to figure out just where the technology is, how fast it's moving, um, and can really uh, become literate and up to speed with respect to what to expect. Um, so I think that today the answer really is about 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 measurement, um, and I think that there will be a time uh, and place where that will change. And uh, I think it's a little bit hard to predict exactly uh, what what exactly that trajectory should look like. So uh, there will be a point at which regulation, federal in the United States, the government steps in and and helps be the I, I don't want to say the adult in the room to make sure that there is strict rules, maybe conservative rules that nobody can cross. Uh, well, I think there's there's kind of maybe two two angles to it. So today with narrow AI applications uh, that I think there are already existing bodies that are responsible and should be responsible for regulation. You think about, for example, with self-driving cars that you want the, uh, you know, the National Highway. Uh, I, NHTSA. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. To, to be regulating that. That makes sense, right? That basically what we're saying is that we're going to have these technological systems that are going to be do, performing applications that humans already do. Great. We already have ways of thinking about standards and safety for those. Um, so I think actually empowering those regulators today is also pretty important. And then I think for, for AGI, 
you know, that there's going to be a point where we'll have better answers. And I think that maybe a similar approach of first measurement and, you know, start thinking about what the rules should be. I think it's really important that we don't prematurely squash, you know, progress. Like I think it's very easy to, to kind of smother the abutting field. And I think that's something to, to really avoid, but I don't think that the right way of doing it is to say, let's just try to blaze ahead and not involve all these other stakeholders. So, uh, You've recently released a paper on uh, GPT-2 language modeling, uh, mm-hmm. uh, but uh, did not release the full model because you had concerns about the possible negative effects of the availability of such model. It's uh, outside of just that decision. It's super interesting because of uh, the discussion as at a societal level, the, the discourse it creates. So it's fascinating in that aspect. But if you think that's the specifics here at first, what are some negative effects that you envisioned? And of course, what are some of the positive effects? Yeah, so again, I think to zoom out, like the way that we thought about GPT-2 is that with language modeling, we are clearly on a trajectory right now where we scale up our models and we get qualitatively better performance, right? GPT-2 itself was actually just a scale up of a model that we released in the previous June, right? And we just ran it at, you know, much larger scale. And we got these results where suddenly starting to write coherent prose, uh, which was not something we'd seen previously. Mm -hmm. And what are we doing now? Well, we're going to scale up GPT-2 by 10x, by 100x, by 1000x, and we don't know what we're going to get. And so it's very clear that the model that that we released last June, you know, I think it's kind of like, it's, 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 it's a good academic toy. It's not something that we think is something that can really have negative applications or, you know, to the extent that it can, that the positive of people being able to play with it uh, is, is you know, far, far outweighs the, 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 the possible harms. You fast forward to not GPT-2, but GPT-20, okay. and you think about what that's going to be like. And I think that the capabilities are going to be substantive. And so there needs to be a point in between the two where you say, this is something where we are drawing the line um, and that we need to start thinking about the safety aspects. And I think for GPT-2, we could have gone either way. And in fact, when we had conversations internally uh, that we had a bunch of pros and cons um, and it wasn't clear which one which one outweighed the other. Um, and I think that when we announced that, hey, we decide not to release this model, um, then there was a bunch of conversation where various people said, it's so obvious that you should have just released it. There are other people said, it's so obvious you should not have released it. And I think that that almost definitionally means that holding it back was the correct de- decision, right? If it's con- if there's if it's not obvious whether something is beneficial or not, you should probably default to caution. And so I think that the, that, the, that the overall landscape for how we think about it is that this decision could have gone either way. There's great arguments in both directions. But for future models down the road, um, and possibly sooner than, than, than you'd expect, because you know, scaling these things up doesn't actually take that long, those ones you're definitely not going to want to, to release into the wild. And so um, I think that we, we almost view this as a test case and to see, can we even design, you know, how, how do you have a society or how do you have a system that goes from having no concept of responsible disclosure where the mere idea of not releasing something for safety reasons is unfamiliar to a world where you say, okay, we have a powerful model. Let's at least think about it. Let's go through some process. And you think about the security community. It took them a long time to design responsible disclosure, right? You know, you think about this question of, well, I have a security exploit. I send it to the company. The company is like, tries to prosecute me or just sit, just ignores it. What do I do, right? And so, you know, the alternatives of, oh, I just, just always publish your exploits. That doesn't seem good either, right? And so it really took a long time and took this, this uh, it was bigger than any individual, right? It's really about building a whole community that believe that, okay, we'll have this process where you send it to the company. You know, if they don't act in a certain time, then you can go public and you're not a bad person. You've done the right thing. Um, and I think that in AI, part of the, the response to GPT-2 just proves that we don't have any concept of this. Um, so that's the high level picture. Um, and so I think that, I think this was, this was a really important move to make. Um, and we could have maybe delayed it for GPT three, but I'm really glad we did it for GPT two. And so now you look at GPT two itself and you think about the substance of, okay, what are potential negative applications? So you have this model that's been trained on the internet, which, you know, it's also going to be a bunch of very biased data, a bunch of, you know, very, uh, offensive content in there. Uh, and, uh, you can ask it to generate content for you on basically any topic, right? You just give it a prompt and it'll just start start writing and it writes 
content like you see on the internet, you know, even down to like saying advertisement (laughs) in the middle of of some of its generations. And uh, you think about the possibilities for generating fake news or abusive content. And, you know, it's interesting seeing what people have done with, uh, you know, we released a smaller version of GPT-2 and uh, that people have done things like try to generate, uh, you know, to take my own Facebook message history and generate more Facebook messages like me Mm -hmm. um, and uh, people generating fake politician uh, uh, content or, uh, you know, there's a bunch of, of things there where you at least have to think, is this going to be good for the world? There's the flip side, which is I think that there's a lot of awesome applications that we really want to see, like creative uh, applications in terms of if you have sci-fi authors that can work with this tool and come with cool ideas, like that seems that seems awesome. If we can write better sci-fi through the use of, the, of these tools, and we've actually had a bunch of people write into us asking, "Hey, can we use it for you know a variety of different creative applications?" So the positive are actually pretty easy to imagine. Uh, there. F- you know the the usual NLP applications are really interesting, but let let's go there. It's kind of interesting to think about a world where uh, look at Twitter, where not just fake news, but smarter and smarter bots being able to uh, spread in an interesting, complex networking way in information that just floods out us regular human beings with our original thoughts. So uh, what are your views of this world with GPT-20, right? Mm-hmm. What do you, how do we think about it? Again, it's like one of those things about in the 50s trying to describe the, uh, the internet or the smartphone. What do you think about that world, the nature of information? Do we, uh, do, one possibility is that we'll always try to design systems that identify a robot versus human and we'll do so successfully, and so we'll authenticate that we're still human. And the other world is that we just accept the the fact that we're swimming in a sea of fake news mm-hmm. and just learn to swim there. Well, have, have you ever seen the uh, there's there's a you know pop, popular uh, meme of uh, of uh, robot uh, with with a physical physical arm and pen clicking the I'm not a robot button. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I think I think that the truth is that uh, that really trying to distinguish between robot and human is a losing battle ultimately you think it's a losing battle i think it's a losing battle ultimately right i think that that is that in terms of of the content in terms of the actions that you can take i mean think about how captures have gone right the captures used to be a very nice simple you just have this image all of our ocr is terrible you put a couple of of artifacts in it you know humans are going to be able to tell what 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 it is an ai system wouldn't be able to Today, like I could barely do captures, yeah. And I think that, that that this is just kind of where we're going. I think captures were were a moment in time thing, and as AI systems become more powerful, that there being human capabilities that can be measured in a very easy automated way uh, that that AIs will not be capable of. I think that's just like it's just an increasingly hard technical battle. But it's not that all hope is lost, right? And you think about uh, how do we already authenticate ourselves, right? That you know we have systems, we have social security numbers if you're in the US or you know you have you have uh, uh, you know ways of identifying individual people um, and having real world identity tied to to digital identity seems like a step uh, towards you know authenticating the source of content rather than the content itself um, now there are problems with that how can you have privacy and anonymity in a world where the only content you can really trust is or the only way you can trust content is by looking at where it comes from um, and so i think that building out good reputation networks uh, may be maybe one possible solution but yeah i think that this this question is is not an obvious one and i think that we you know maybe sooner than we think we'll be in a world where you know today i often will read a tweet and be like hmm, do i feel like a real human wrote this or you know do i feel like this is like genuine i feel like i can kind of judge the content a little bit um and i think in the future it just won't be the case you look at for example the fcc comments on net neutrality uh it came out later that millions of those were auto-generated and that the researchers were able to do various statistical te- techniques to do that what do you do in a world where those statistical techniques don't exist. It's just impossible to tell the difference between humans and AIs. And in fact, the uh, the 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 most persuasive arguments are written by by AI. All that stuff. It's not sci-fi anymore. You look at GPT two making a great argument for why recycling is bad for the world. You got to read that and be like, huh? You're right. We are addressing just the <laughs> symptoms. <laughs> yeah, that's that's quite interesting. I mean, ultimately, it boils down to 
the physical world being the last frontier of proving, so you said like basically networks of people, humans vouching for humans in the physical world. And somehow the authentication uh, ends there. I mean, if I had to ask you, I mean, you're way too eloquent for a human. So if I had to ask you to authenticate, like prove, how do I know you're not a robot and how do you know I'm not a robot? Yeah. I, I think that's so far we're, we're this in this space, this conversation we just had, the physical movements we did is the biggest gap between us and AI systems is the physical the manipulation. So maybe that's the last frontier. Well, here's another question is, is, you know, why, why is, why is solving this problem important? Right? Like what aspects are really important to us? And I think that probably where we'll end up is we'll hone in on what do we really want out of knowing if we're talking to a human um, and, uh, and I think that, again, this comes down to identity. And so I think that, that the Internet of the future, I expect to be one that will have lots of agents out there uh, that will interact with, with you. But I think that the question of is this, you know, a flesh, real flesh and blood uh, human or is this an automated system uh, may, may actually just be less important. Let's actually go there. It's GPT-2 is impressive. And let's look at GPT-20. Why is it so bad that all my friends are GPT-20? Why, why, why is it so why is it so important on the internet do you think uh, to interact with only human beings why can't we live in a world where ideas can come from models trained on human data yeah I, I think this is I think this is actually a really interesting question this comes back to the how do you even picture a world with some new technology right and I think that that one thing that I think is important is is you know let's say honesty um and i think that if you have you know almost in the, the turing test style uh sense sense of, of of technology you have ais that are pretending to be humans and deceiving you mm -hmm. uh, i think that is you know that that feels like a bad thing right i think that it's really important that we feel like we're in control of our environment right that we understand who we're interacting with and if it's an ai or a human um that, that that's not something that we're being deceived about but I think that the flip side of can I have as meaningful of an interaction with an AI as I can with a human? Uh, well, I actually think here you can turn to sci-fi. Um, and her, I think, is a great example mm -hmm. of asking this very question, right? And one thing I really love about her is it really starts out almost by asking how meaningful are human virtual relationships, right? And uh, and then you have a human who has a relationship with an AI and uh, that you really start to be drawn into that, right? And that all of your emotional buttons get triggered in the same way as if there was a real human that was on the other side of that phone. And so I think that that this is one way of thinking about it is that I think that we can have meaningful interactions and that if there's a funny joke, in some sense it doesn't really matter if it was written by a human or an AI, but what you don't want and what I th where I think we should really draw hard lines is deception. Um, and I think that as long as we're in a world where, you know, why do, why do we build AI systems at all? Right. The reason we want to build them is to enhance human lives, to make humans be able to do more things, to have human humans feel more fulfilled. And if we can build AI systems that do that, uh, you know, sign me up. So the process of language modeling, uh, how far do you think it takes us? Let's look at movie Her. Do you think uh, a dialogue, natural language conversation is formulated by the Turing test, for example, do you think that process could be achieved through this kind of unsupervised language modeling? So I think the Turing test in its, in its real form uh, isn't just about language, right? It's really about reasoning too. Right, that to really pass the Turing test, I should be able to teach calculus to whoever's on the other side and have it really understand calculus and be able to, you know, go and, and solve new calculus problems. And so I think that to really solve the Turing test, we need more than what we're seeing with language models. We need some way of plugging in reasoning. Now, how different will that be from what we already do? That's an open question, right? It might be that we need some sequence of totally radical new ideas, or it might be that we just need to kind of shape our existing systems in a slightly different way. But I think that in terms of how far language modeling will go, it's already gone way further than many people would have expected, right? I think that things like, uh, and I think there's a lot of really interesting angles to poke in terms of how much does GPT-2 understand physical world? Like, you know, you, you read a little bit about fire underwater uh, in, in GPT-2. So it's like, okay, maybe it doesn't quite understand what these things are. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, uh, I think that you also see various things like smoke coming from flame and you know a bunch of these things that GPT-2, it has no body, it has no physical experience. It's just statically read data. Um, and uh, I think that 
I think that the answer is like, we don't know yet. Um, and these questions though, we're starting to be able to actually ask them to physical systems, uh, that ex to real systems that exist. And that's very exciting. Do you think, uh, what's your intuition? Do you think if you just scale language modeling, uh, like uh, significantly scale, that reasoning can emerge from the same exact mechanisms? I think it's unlikely that if we just scale uh, GPT-2 that we'll have reasoning in, in the full-fledged way. And I think that there's like, you know, the type signature is a little bit wrong, right? That like there's something we do with that we call thinking, right? Where we spend a lot of compute, like a variable amount of compute to get to better answers, right? I think a little bit harder, mm -hmm. I get a better answer. And that that kind of type signature isn't quite encoded in a GPT, right? GPT will kind of like, it's spent a long time in it's like evolutionary history, baking in all this information, getting very, very good at this predictive process. And then at runtime, I just kind of do one forward pass and, uh, and I'm able to generate stuff. And so, you know, there might be small tweaks to what we do in order to get the type signature, right? For example, well, you know, it's not really one forward pass, right? You know, you generate symbol by symbol. Mm -hmm. And so maybe you generate like a whole sequence of, of, of thoughts and you only keep like the last bit or something. Right. Um, but I think that at the very least, I would expect you have to make changes like that. Yeah, yeah, just exactly how we, th you said, think is the process of generating thought by thought in the same kind of way, like you said, keep the last bit, the thing that we converge towards. Yep. Uh, and I think there's there's another piece which is which is interesting, which is this out of distribution generalization, right? Mm -hmm. That like thinking somehow lets us do that, right? That we haven't experienced a thing, and yet somehow we just kind of keep refining our mental model of it. Um, this is again something that feels tied to whatever reasoning is and maybe it's a small tweak to what we do maybe it's many ideas and we'll take as many decades yeah so the the assumption there uh, generalization out of distribution is that it's possible to create new new ideas mm -hmm. uh the you know it's possible that nobody's ever created any new ideas and then with scaling gpt2 to gpt20 uh you would you would essentially generalize to all possible thoughts yeah. that us humans can have. <laughs> just, I mean, to, just to play devil's advocate, right, right, right. I mean, how many, how many uh, new, new story ideas have we come up with since Shakespeare? Right? Yeah, exactly. It's, <laughs> it's just all different forms of love and drama and so on. Okay. Not sure if you read a bit of lesson, a recent blog post by Ray Sutton. Yep, I have. He basically <clears throat> says uh, something that echoes some of the ideas that you've been talking about, which is, uh, he says the biggest lesson that can be read from 70 years of AI research is that general methods that leverage computation are ultimately going to uh, ultimately win out. Uh, do you agree with this? So basically, uh, and open AI in general, about the ideas that you're exploring, about coming up with methods, whether it's GPT-2 modeling or whether it's uh, open AI 5 playing Dota, where a general method is uh, better than a more fine-tuned, expert-tuned method. Yeah, so I think that, well, one thing that I think was really interesting about the reaction to that blog post was that a lot of people have read this as saying that compute is all that matters. Mm -hmm. And that's a very threatening idea, right? And I don't think it's a true idea either, right? It's very clear that we have algorithmic ideas that have been very important for making progress and to really build AGI, you wanna push as far as you can on the computational scale and you wanna push as far as you can on human human ingenuity. And so I think you need both. But I think the way that you phrase the question is actually very good, right? That it's really about what kind of ideas should we be striving for? And absolutely, if you can find a scalable idea, you pour more compute into it, you pour more data into it, it gets better. Like that's, that's the real holy grail. And so I think that, uh, that, that the answer to, to the question, I think, is, is yes, um, that, that that's really how we think about it, and that part of why we're excited about the power of deep learning, the potential for building AGI, is because we look at the systems that exist in the most successful AI systems, and we realize that you scale those up, they're going to work better. And I think that that scalability is something that really gives us hope for being able to build transformative systems. So I'll tell you, this is a partially an emotional, you know, a thing that, a response that people often have, if compute is so important for state-of-the-art performance, you know, individual developers, maybe a 13-year-old sitting somewhere in Kansas or something like that, you know, they're sitting, they, they might not even have a GPU and or may have a single GPU, a 1080 or something like that. And there's this feeling like, well, how can I possibly compete or contribute to this world of AI if uh, scale is so important. 
So for, if you can comment on that, and in general, do you think we need to also in the future focus on uh, democratizing compute resources more, more or as much as we democratize the algorithms? Well, so the way that I think about it is that there's this space of, of possible progress, right? There's a space of ideas and sort of systems that, that will work, that will move us forward. And there's a portion of that space, and to some extent, an increasingly significant portion of that space that does just require massive compute resources. And for that, that I think that, that the answer is kind of clear and that part of why we have the structure that, that we do is because we think it's really important to be pushing the scale and to be you know, building these large clusters and systems. But there's another part, portion of the space that isn't about the large scale compute that are these ideas that, and again, I think that for the ideas to really be impactful and really shine, that they should be ideas that if you scale them up would work way better than they do at small scale. Um, but that you can discover them without massive computational resources. And if you look at the history of, of recent developments, you think about things like the GAN or the VAE, that these are ones that I think you could come up with them uh, without having, and you know, in practice people did come up with, with them without having massive, massive computational resources. Right, I just talked to Ian Goodfellow, but the thing is the in initial GAN produced pretty terrible results. Right, so only because it was in a very specific, it was because, only because they're smart enough to know that this is quite surprising it can generate anything that they know. I mean, do you see a world, or is that too optimistic and dreamer-like to imagine that the compute resources are something that's owned by governments and provided uh, as a utility? Actually, to some extent, this this question reminds me of of a blog post from one of my former professors at Harvard, mm -hmm. uh, this guy Matt Matt Welsh, who was a systems professor. And I remember sitting in his tenure talk, right, and uh, you know that that he had literally just gotten tenure. He went to Google for the summer uh, and uh, uh, then decided he wasn't going back to academia, mm -hmm. yeah. right? And that kind of in his blog post, he makes this point that look, as a systems researcher, that I come up with these cool system ideas, right, and I kind of build a little proof of concept. And the best thing I can hope for is that the people at Google or Yahoo, um, which was around at the time, uh, <laughs> will implement it and yeah. like actually make it work at scale, yeah. right? That's like the dream for me, right? I build the little thing and they turn it into the big thing that's actually working. Um, and uh, for him, he said, I'm done with that. I want to be the person who's who's actually doing building and, and, and deploying. And I think that there's a similar dichotomy here, right? I think that there are people who really actually th find value. And I think it is a valuable thing to do to be the person who produces those ideas, right? Who builds the proof of concept. And yeah, you don't get to generate the coolest possible GAN images, yeah. but you invented the GAN, right? right? And so that there's, that there's, there's a real trade-off there. And I think that that's a very personal choice, but I think there's value in both sides. So do you think... Uh creating AGI something or some new models uh, would we would see echoes of the brilliance even at the prototype level so you would be able to develop those ideas without scale the initial so, uh, seeds well, so take, take a look at uh, you know I always like to look at at examples that, that exist right? right look at real precedent and so take a look at the June uh, 2018 model that we released that we scaled up to turn into GPT2 mm -hmm. and you can see that at small scale, it set some records, right? This was, you know, the original GPT. We actually had some some cool generations. They weren't nearly as 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 amazing and really stunning as the GPT two ones, mm -hmm. but it was promising. It was interesting, and so I think it is the case that with a lot of these ideas, that you see promise at small scale. But there is an asterisk here, a very big asterisk, which is sometimes we see behaviors that emerge that are qualitatively different from anything we saw at small scale, and that the original inventor of whatever algorithm looks at it and says, I didn't think it could do that. Mm. This is what we saw in Dota, right? So PPO was, was created by John Schulman, who's a researcher mm -hmm. here. And, uh, and with, with Dota, we basically just ran PPO at massive, massive scale. And, uh, you know, there's some tweaks in order, to, in order to make it work, but fundamentally it's PPO at the core. And we were able to get this long-term planning, these, these behaviors to really play out, uh, on a time scale that we just thought was not possible. Um, and John looked at that and was like, I didn't think it could do that. That's what happens when you're at three orders of magnitude more scale uh, than you <laughs> tested at. Yeah, but it still has the same flavors of, uh, you know, uh, at least echoes of the expected billions. Uh, I, although I suspect with GPT scaled more and more, you might get surprising things. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, you're right. It's, it, it's interesting. It's, it, it's difficult to see how far an idea will go when it's scaled. 
It's an open question. Well, so to that point with with Dota and PPO, like I mean, here's here's a very concrete one, right? Yeah. It's like um, it's actually one thing that's very surprising about Dota that I think people don't really pay that much attention to is the degree of generalization out of distribution that happens, right? That you have this AI that's trained against other bots for its entirety, the entirety of its existence. So, sorry to take a step back. Can you can you t- talk through in in you know a, a story of Dota, a story of uh, leading up to opening I five yep. and uh, that past, and uh, what was the process of self play and so on of training? Yep. On yeah, 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 yeah. So, so with Dota, and what is Dota? <laughs> yeah, so Dota is a complex video game, yeah. and we started training. We started trying to solve Dota because we felt like this was a step towards the real world relative to other games like chess or Go. Right, those very cerebral games where you just kind of have this board of very discrete moves. Dota starts to be much more continuous time that you have this huge variety of different actions that you have a 45 minute game with all these different units and uh, it's got a lot of messiness to it uh, that, that really hasn't been captured by, by previous games. And famously, all of the hard coded bots for Dota were terrible. Right? It's just impossible to write anything good for it because it's so complex. And so this seemed like a really good place to push what's the state of the art in, in reinforcement learning. And so we started by focusing on the one versus one version of the game and uh, and, and we're able to, to solve that. We're able to beat the world champions and the, 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 the learning, you know, the, the skill curve was this crazy exponential, right? And it was like constantly we were just scaling up that we were fixing bugs and, you know, that you look at the, at the skill curve and it was really a very, very smooth one. Uh, so it's actually really interesting to see how that like human iteration loop yielded very steady exponential progress and uh to one, one side note first of all it's an exceptionally popular video game the side effect is that there's a lot of incredible human experts at that video game so the benchmark that you're trying to reach is is very high and the other can you talk about the approach that was used initially and throughout of yep. training these uh, agents to play this game yep and so the approach that we used is self-play and so you have two agents that don't know anything they battle each other they discover something a little bit good, and now they both know it, and they just get better and better and better without bound. And that's a really powerful idea, right? Uh, that we then went from the one versus one version of the game and scaled up to five versus five, right? So you think about kind of like with basketball, where you have this like team sport and you need to do all this coordination, um, and we were able to push the same idea, the same self play uh, to. So to, to, to really get to the professional level at the full five versus five version of the game. And, uh, and, and, and the things that I think are really interesting here is that these agents, in some ways, they're almost like an insect-like intelligence, right? Where the, you know, there's, they have a lot in common with how an insect is trained, right? Insect kind of lives in this environment for a very long time, or you know, the, the ancestors of this insect have been around for a long time and had a lot of experience that gets baked into, into, into this agent. And you know, it's not really smart in the sense of a human, right? It's not able to go and, and learn calculus, but it's able to navigate its environment extremely well. And it's able to handle unexpected things in the environment that's never seen before pretty well. Um, and we see the same sort of thing with our Dota bots, right? That they're able to, in, within this game, they're able to play against humans, mm. which is something that never existed in its evolutionary environment. Totally different play styles from humans versus the bots. And yet it's able to handle it extremely well. And that's something that I think was very surprising to us, was something that doesn't really emerge from what we've seen with PPO at smaller scale. Right, and the kind of scale we we're running this stuff at was, uh, you know, like let's say like a hundred thousand CPU cores running with like hundreds of GPUs. Uh, it was probably about, uh, you know, like, you know, so- something like hundreds of of years of experience going into this bot every single real day, and so that scale is massive, and we start to see very different kinds of behaviors out of the algorithms that we all know and love. Dota, you mentioned, beat the world expert one v one, and then. Uh... You uh, didn't weren't able to win five v five this year. Yeah, at the, at the best players in the world. Uh, so what's what's the comeback story? What's first of all talk through that? That was yep. an exceptionally yep. exciting event. And uh, what's what's the, the following months and this year look like? Yeah, yeah. So well, one thing that, that's interesting is that uh, you know we lose all the time because we, we play. Who's we here? So the Dota team at yeah. OpenAI, yeah. we we play the bot against better players than our system all the time or at least we, we, we used to, right? Like, you know, the, the the first time we lost publicly was we went up on stage at the International and we played against some of the best teams in the world um, and we ended up losing both games. But 
we give them a run for their money, right? That both games were kind of 30 minutes, 25 minutes, and they went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And so I think that really shows that we're at the professional level um, and that kind of looking at those games, we think that the coin could have gone a different direction and we could have could have had some wins. So that, that was actually very encouraging for us. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, it's interesting because the international was at a fixed time, right? So we, we knew exactly what day we were going to be playing and we pushed as far as we could, as fast as we could. Two weeks later, we had a bot that had an 80% win rate versus the one that played at TI. Um, so the march of progress, uh, you know, you should think of it as a snapshot rather than as an end state. Um, and so, in fact, we'll we'll be announcing our uh, our, our finals uh, pr- pretty soon. I actually think that uh, we'll announce our final match uh, prior to uh, this podcast being released. Okay, so nice. <laughs> uh, there should be uh, we'll be playing we'll be playing uh, against the the world champions. And you know, for us, it's really less about like the, the way that we think about what what's upcoming is the final milestone, the final competitive milestone for the project, right? That our goal in all of this isn't really about beating humans at Dota. Mm -hmm. Our goal is to push the state of the art in reinforcement learning. And we've done that, right? And we've actually learned a lot from our system and that we have, uh, you know, I think a lot of exciting next steps that we want to take. And so, you know, kind of the final showcase of what we built, we're going to do this match. Um, but for us, it's not really the success or failure um, to see, you know, do, 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 do we have the coin flip go in our direction or against? Where do you see the field of deep learning heading in the next few years? Uh, where do you see the work and reinforcement learning perhaps heading? And uh, more specifically with OpenAI, all the exciting projects that you're working on, what does 2019 hold for you? Massive scale. Scale. I will put an asterisk on that and just say, you know, I think that it's about ideas plus scale. You need both. So that's a really uh, good uh, point. So the, the question in terms of ideas, you have a lot of projects that are exploring different areas of intelligence. And uh, the question is, when you when you think of scale, do you think about growing the scale of those individual projects or do you think about adding new projects and uh sorry to uh, and if you're thinking about adding new projects or if you look at the past what's the process of coming up with new projects and new ideas yep uh, so we really have a life cycle of project here uh, so we start with a few people uh, just working on a small scale idea and language is actually a very good example of this that is really you know one person here who was pushing on language for a long time i mean then you get signs of life Right. And so this is like, let's say, uh, you know, with with the original GPT, we had something that was interesting and we said, OK, it's time to scale this. Right. It's time to put more people on it, put more computational resources behind it. And uh, and then we just kind of keep pushing and keep pushing. And the end state is something that looks like Dota or robotics, where you have a large team of you know 10 or 15 people uh, that are running things at very large scale uh, and that you're able to really have material engineering uh, and and uh, and and, you know, sort of machine learning science coming together to make systems that work uh, and get material results that just would have been impossible otherwise. Um, so we do that whole life cycle. We've done it a number of times, uh, you know, typically end to end. It's probably two uh, two years or so uh, to do it. Uh, you know, the organization's been around for three years, so maybe we'll find that we also have longer life cycle projects. Um, but, you know, we, we, uh, uh, we'll, we'll work up to those. We have uh, so so one one team that we were actually just starting. Ilya and I are are kicking off a new team called the Reasoning Team, and that this is to really try to tackle how do you get neural networks to reason. Uh, and uh, we think that this will be a long term project, uh, and it's one that we're very excited about. Uh, in terms of reasoning, super exciting topic. What do you what kind of benchmarks, uh, what kind of tests of reasoning do you envision? What what would if you set back. Uh, with whatever drink and you would be impressed that this system is able to do something what would that look like uh theorem proving theorem proving so some kind of logic and especially mathematical logic i think so right and i think that there's 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 kind of other problems that are dual to theorem proving in particular um you know you think about uh programming uh, i think about even like security analysis of of code um that these all kind of capture the same sorts of core reasoning and, and being able to do some out of distribution generalization it would be quite exciting if open ai reasoning team was able to prove that p equals np that would be very nice uh, it would be very 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 exciting especially uh, <laughs> if it turns out that p equals np that'll be interesting too it be <laughs> <laughs> uh, just it would be uh ironic and humorous yep uh so what problem stands out to you as uh 
the most uh, exciting and challenging impactful to the work for us as a community in general and for open AI this year. You mentioned reasoning. I think that's that's a heck of a problem. Yeah. So I think reasoning is an important one. I think it's going to be hard to get good results in 2019. Um, you know, again, just like we think about the life cycle it takes time. Um, I think for 2019, language modeling seems to be kind of on that ramp, right? It's at the point that we have a technique that works. We want to scale 100x, 1000x, see what happens. Awesome. Do you think we're living in a simulation? Uh, I think it's I think it's hard to have a a, a real opinion about it. Uh, you know, it's actually interesting. I separate out things that I think can have like you know yield materially different predictions about the world um, from ones that are just kind of you know fun fun to speculate about. And I, I kind of view simulation as more like is there a flying teapot between Mars and Jupiter? Like maybe, but it's a little bit hard to know what that would mean for my life. So there is something actionable. I, so th some of the best work OpenAI has done is in the field of reinforcement learning. And uh, some of the success of reinforcement learning come from being able to simulate the problem you're trying to solve. So it, do you have a hope for reinforcement, for the future of reinforcement learning and for the future of simulation? Like whether it's we're talking about autonomous vehicles or any kind of system, do you see that scaling to where we'll be able to simulate systems and, and hence be able to create a simulator that echoes our real world and uh, proving once and for all, even though you're denying it, that we're living in a simulation? <laughs> I feel like there's two separate questions, right? So, you know, kind of, kind of at the core there of like, can we, can we use simulation for self-driving cars? Um, take a look at our robotic system, Dactyl, right? That was trained in simulation using the Dota system, in fact, and it transfers to a physical robot. And I think everyone looks at our Dota system, they're like, okay, it's just a game. How are you ever going to escape to the real world? And the answer is, well, we did it with a physical robot that no one could program. And so I think the answer is simulation goes a lot further than you think um, if you apply the right techniques to it. Um, now, there's a question of, you know, are the beings in that simulation going to gonna wake up and, and have consciousness? Um, I think that one seems a, a lot a lot harder to, to, again, reason about. I think that, you know, you really should think about, like, where where exactly does human consciousness come from and our own self-awareness? And, you know, is it just that, like, once you have, like, a complicated enough neural net, do you have to worry about the, the agents feeling pain? Um, and, uh, you know, I think there's, like, interesting speculation to, to do there. But, uh, but you know, I, again, I think it's it's a little bit hard to know for sure. Well, let me just keep with the speculation. Do you yep. think uh, to create intelligence, general intelligence, you need one consciousness and two a body? Do you think any of those elements are needed, or is intelligence something that's that's orthogonal to those? I'll stick to the the kind of like the the, the non grand answer first, right? So the non grand answer is just to look at you know what are we already making work. You look at GPT-2, a lot of people would have said that to even get these kinds of results, you need real world experience. You need a body. You need grounding. How are you supposed to reason about any of these things? How are you supposed to like even kind of know about smoke and fire and those things if you've never experienced them? Right. And GPT-2 shows that you can actually go way further than that kind of reasoning would predict. So... I think that, that, that in, in terms of do we need consciousness, do we need a body, it seems the answer is probably not, right? That we could probably just continue to push kind of the systems we have. They already feel general. Um, they're not as competent or as general or able to learn as quickly as an AGI would. But, you know, they're at least like kind of proto-AGI in some way. And they don't need any of those things. Now, now let's move to the grand answer, which is, you know, if our, our neural nets, nets conscious already, would we ever know? How can we tell? Right. And, you know, here, here's where the speculation starts to become, become, you know, at least interesting or fun and maybe a little bit disturbing it, depending on, on where you take it. But it certainly seems that when we think about animals, that there's some continuum of, of, of consciousness, you know, my cat, I think is, uh, is conscious in some way, right. Uh, you know, not as conscious as a human. And you, know, you could imagine that you could build like a little consciousness meter, right. You point at a cat, it gives you a little reading, point at a human it gives you much bigger reading. What would happen if you pointed one of those at a Dota neural net? And if you're training in this massive simulation, do the neural nets feel pain? You know, it becomes pretty hard to know that the answer is no. Um, and it becomes pretty hard to, to really think about what that would mean if the answer were yes. And it's very possible, you know, for example, you could imagine that maybe the reason that humans are have consciousness is because it's a it's a convenient computational shortcut, right? If you think about it, if you have a being that wants to avoid pain, which seems pretty important 
to survive in this environment um, and wants to like, you know, eat food, um, then that maybe the best way of doing it is to have a being that's conscious, right? Mm -hmm. That, you know, in order to succeed in the environment, you need to have those properties and how are you supposed to implement them? And maybe this, this consciousness is a way of doing that. If that's true, then actually maybe we should expect that really competent reinforcement learning agents will also have consciousness. But, you know, it's a big if. And uh, I think there are a lot of other arguments that you can make in other directions. I think that's a really interesting idea that even GPT-2 has some degree of consciousness. That's something uh, is actually not as crazy to think about. It's useful to think about as, as we think about what it means to create intelligence of a dog, intelligence of a cat, uh, and the intelligence of a human. So last question, do you think we will ever fall in love, like in the movie Her, with an artificial intelligence system, or an artificial intelligence system falling out in love with a human? I hope so. If there's any better way to end it, it's on uh, love. So Greg, thanks so much for talking today. Thank you for having me.